Hi, I'm Larry Sago, and I'd like to speak to you a minute about Habitat for Humanity. Seeking to put God's love into action, Habitat brings people together to build homes, communities, and hope. Last year, Due West was able to participate with the Cobb Interfaith Habit Coalition to build an affordable home for an amazing family in Austell. The coalition is composed of nine churches, a synagogue, and a mosque. This proved to be a very rewarding experience, partnering with people of various faiths to come together as one body with a common goal of providing affordable housing for people in need. And we have chosen to participate again this year. Building a Habitat home is a two-part process. First comes the fundraising required to pay for building materials. Second is the volunteer labor of love we provide for the actual build. The fundraising part is especially critical this year as the cost of building materials has significantly increased post-pandemic. You'll see a fundraiser online and in the Church Center app in the coming week. Please prayerfully consider helping Do West fundraising goal for this wonderful mission. Our goal this year is to raise $5,000. Thank you. Well, good morning, Do West. It's so wonderful to be in worship with you. As you heard uh, from Larry, we're so thankful for him uh, heading up our work with the Habitat for Humanity. We're excited to participate in that again this year. It was so rewarding to be with the family in Austell, as he mentioned last year. And we're so glad to be able to participate in that this year. Uh, if you would like to participate in that, if you would like to uh, give to the cause, he said we're trying to raise at least $5,000. Uh, you can do that uh, in two ways. You can obviously give uh, and place that in the basket. If you've got a, a check, you can just write in the memo, uh, Habitat for Humanity. Or if it's easier for you, uh, you can actually go online to doas.org slash give. Uh, and where the drop-down bar is, uh, there's actually a Habitat for Humanity link. So you just click on that. And then anything you give through that goes to Habitat for Humanity. Uh, we appreciate your support of that project. It would not be possible without you. Uh, so we appreciate that. One other thing to mention with you this morning before we get started. Uh, it is Super Sunday. We've been talking about that for the last couple of weeks. Uh, there's a big game tonight. I have heard uh, we on, on the annual kind of coming together of that big game always gather soup for Must Ministries. Uh, and so if you have soup that you want to give to that, you can place that in the collection bins across campus. Uh, if you forgot your soup today, that's quite all right. Uh, we're collecting those through tomorrow. So we're so thankful uh, for your participation in that as well. Uh, but I'm glad we have the chance to worship together this morning. Uh, will you begin in prayer with me? Gracious and almighty God, we are so thankful that you have called us to be your people. Lord, that you have given us this space to come and proclaim your name. Because, Lord, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. It is you who reigns on high, and it is yours that we offer our praise to forever. So, God, we ask that you bless this time together, that you bind us together in your love, that as we sing and as we praise, we share with the world the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, the King who came to reign among us, the King who came to die on our behalf. Lord, may, may we proclaim your good news to all the world. For Lord, it is in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our King of kings, that we offer this prayer. Amen. Let us stand together and worship. Amen. Are y'all ready to worship your Lord this morning? I said, are y'all ready to worship your Lord this morning? Hey, hey, why don't you put your hands together? We're going to make a loud noise as we worship our King, as we worship our God.
unstoppable God, right? All right, awesome. Four of you do. Uh, would you have a seat for just a moment? Good morning, Due West, and welcome to worship. My name's Austin, and I have a few announcements before we get started. This Thursday through Saturday, we have our wonderfully made event. This event is for fifth and sixth graders and their parents. The preteen years are tough, and we want to equip you with faith-based answers to the hard questions. If you'd like to attend this event, please let us know by Wednesday by registering on the Church Center app or through our website. On February 23rd, we have our Mission Insight Dinner. This Mission Insight Dinner will focus on Venezuela now. If you'd like to attend and get a free dinner, let us know you're coming by registering on Church Center. Lastly, we have music, movies, and more coming up on March 13th. This is a fundraiser for our youth choir. They're going to Pensacola, Florida this summer. So we wanna get them started off right. It'll be a variety show and a silent auction. If you'd like to donate anything for the silent auction, please reach out to Amy Quower as soon as possible. Now, let us jump into worship. Yeah, you heard it, movies, music, and more. That is coming very soon. And, and as as we in a few weeks, you're actually going to have the beautiful experience of in this service, the youth will youth choir will come and lead the entire service, the, the music for you, um, in just a couple weeks as we get ready to do that uh, service. So um, y'all just keep that in mind, put it on your calendars. But um, we're going to let church happen this morning. We're going to let the gospel of truth impact our very hearts and souls. Can y'all say amen? Can y'all say amen like you mean it? Can y'all stand up as you're able? Stand up. We're going to praise Jesus. Can y'all say hallelujah? If y'all have any burdens this morning, I encourage you to lay them down at the foot of the cross. We're going to worship Jesus Christ right now. Can y'all say amen? Yeah. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. You've been hearing the same old voice and the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the same old holes inside, well, there's a better life. There's a better life. A chain breaker. Oh, and so we say, hey, we've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things we know just ain't right. When there's a better life. Freedom, save it. 
that takes away our chains. Amen? We want to keep on giving him the worship, keep on giving him the praise, keep on, keep on. Because when God makes a promise, he doesn't make it just for one time. He makes it again and again and again. His promises last forever. So when he says he will take away your pain, it's not just once, it's always. Sing this together. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come.
to generation over all the earth and what you have told us in your holy word what you did once you did for always what Jesus did once stands for all time so Lord we know and we stand on your promises because you truly have never failed us and you never will we pray this, and we know this, and we declare this in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. way to start the morning, right? Just to gather together and sing the praises of the Lord. Was that not just a great way to start the day? Yeah. Amen. All right. Uh, I want to read this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as we get started for the day. If you have your Bibles or it's on the screen, we're doing chapter 2, the first five verses. Uh, and this is what it says. And so it was with me, brothers, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. And we praise you for your word. And we ask this morning that you would speak to us. Open our hearts, open our minds, open our spirits. So that you might speak to us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're now in week six uh, in this series that we're calling Genesis to Maps. Think of it as a big overview of the Bible. Uh, the view from 30,000 feet, as it were. We started at the beginning, the book of Genesis uh, going through the book of Revelation uh, and on past the book of Revelation to the maps in the back of your Bible. Right? We're doing a map every week. And we're doing this in sections. We started with this section of the Bible that we call the law, the fir those first five books. And then we talked about the history section of the Bible. And then the section on wisdom literature. And then the section on prophets. Those four sections make up our Old Testament. And then last week we talked a little bit about the Gospels and the book of Acts. In a minute we'll talk about letters. And we say the easiest one for last. Next week we'll do the book of Revelation. All right. So uh, why are we doing this? Because through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible has the potential to change us, to transform us, to remake us into the image and likeness of Jesus. So maybe this is all review for you, or maybe it's new, but in either case, for the Bible to have that kind of impact on, on you, 
you have to read it. Uh, so hopefully through all of this, it'll just increase your appetite just to spend time every day letting God speak to you through his word. Now this morning we're up to, as I said, week six, we're talking about letters. In the New Testament, there are 27 books. 21 of them are letters. So this makes up quite a bit of the New Testament. Most written by the Apostle Paul, but not all of them. There were some written by others. That would be Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the tiny little letter called Jude. Paul's letters, which make up the majority, you can divide up into two different categories. There are letters written to individuals, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. And then the rest are written to churches. Generally, they have the names of <clears throat> cities attached. Generally, they have the names of cities attached to them, uh, written to the churches, to the Christians in those particular cities. That's Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians. You can still go visit all of those places. Now, if you really want to see about Paul's ministry, you need to read the book of Acts. I touched on it last week. His conversion is in chapter 9. He's on the road to Damascus, not as a Christian, but to persecute Christians. And while he is on that road, a light brighter than anything he's ever seen shines from the sky. So bright he is blinded temporarily. And then he hears the voice of Jesus calling his name aloud. Anybody ever had that experience out of curiosity? No? Okay. It happened to Paul as he's traveling to Damascus, and it turned his life around. And he went from persecuting the church to traveling all of the known world, spending the rest of his life traveling the known world with the message of the gospel. Here's our map for the week. Uh, it's really the land, and the, it's hard to distinguish between the color of the land and the color of the sea, so it's not the best map we've got. But it does show you a lot of the places where Paul traveled and preached the modern-day countries of Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, Italy, uh, and on and on. He traveled as, uh, about as far as anybody had traveled in his day, taking the message of the gospel. We're focusing on uh, this little passage from 1 Corinthians, his first letter to the church at Corinth. Now, most of you know that last summer in June, a group of us from Due West had the chance to travel to Greece and we visited Corinth. We got to see where the city was. We got to learn a lot more about the people there and about Paul's ministry there and why he said some of the things that he said. If you want to read about his ministry in Corinth, it's in the 18th chapter of the book of Acts. So Paul is in Corinth. We got a chance to see that. And we're looking at a little bit of chapter 2. So that's kind of our overview of the letters. Now we dive into chapter 2. But before we do that, I want to read to you just one verse from the end of chapter 1. So, beginning of the letter, he says hello, and then he dives in. And in verse 26 of chapter 1, Paul says this to the church. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. Paul knew how to win friends and influence people, right? <laughs> chapter 1, he says hello, and then he says... Remember when we first met, you guys were just not that bright. Remember, that? Remember those days? Uh, that's how he starts. But then we get to chapter 2. And in chapter 2, he turns the mirror on himself. He says this, And so it was with me, brothers, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. So he says, okay, you weren't all that bright. You need to deal with that. But if I'm being totally honest, I'm not a great preacher either, but here we are together. So I read that, and I thought, when I got here five years ago, I missed a golden opportunity to use this passage for my very first sermon. Wouldn't that have been great? <clears throat> I, I'm so glad to be here. Y'all are not real smart, and I'm not real good, but here we are. Uh, but then I found out there was somebody who used this passage for their very first sermon in a church. It was 1974 little town in South Carolina. Preacher went there. He was young. Uh, he went. Now, there's pressure always when you're new 
But the church that he went to, Trinity was the name of the church, the founding pastor of that church was his father-in-law. Yeah, you want, to talk, uh, you want to talk pressure. So there you go. So he reads this on his first Sunday, and I have the opening paragraph of that first sermon. Let me pull it out. He said this, a sermon is much like a first date. I want to do well, put my best foot forward, not say anything too dumb that might render impossible a future relationship, impress you, reassure you that the bishop made a wise decision in sending me to Trinity. To continue my dating analogy, my anxiety is much like that of a blind date. I don't know you and you don't know me. You've heard about me, but only through the advance information from the district superintendent. And you know that district superintendents are sometimes not to be trusted. So that was the beginning of his sermon based on these two passages that say, you're not real smart and I'm not real good. Now you think he probably didn't last too long in the local church. And he didn't last very long in the local church. Not because of that sermon, just because God had other things in store. So the guy that said that and preached that sermon, his name was Will Willimon. He went on to spend years as the dean of the chapel at Duke University and was ultimately, ultimately elected to be a bishop in the United Methodist Church and became known as one of our great preachers. Uh, so maybe there was something to that after all. I mean, there's something to it. Paul, after all, was straightforward. He was honest. He was willing to put his cards on the table and say, listen, it is what it is, right? I'm not real smart, or, or you're not real smart, I'm not real good. We are kind of like a meeting of the unintelligent and the unintelligible. Come together. So, uh, and it kind of does describe situations. If we're honest, if we're honest, that the Bible says every church is filled with saints, but not everybody in every church acts saintly, right? Can we just be honest about that? I mean, every church, most every church, has at least a small contingent that is, what's the polite word for this? Insane, right? Just crazy. Uh, I could tell you some stories. I really could. I've been at this a long time. My wife is going, amen. Yes, she knows. Uh, uh, I've been at this a long time. I could tell you some stories. I won't. Because I made a promise a long time ago, I would never, ever, in a sermon, speak poorly of former church members in a current church. You've never once heard me do that, right? I mean, you, you have never heard me do that because I do not do it. It's not Christian. It's not Christian. Uh, it's just in poor taste. And I, I don't want you guys worried that one day in the future, you're going to be in a sermon somewhere. So I just don't do it. Now, come find me in retirement, okay? And I'll be happy to talk to you. I'll be happy to talk to you. So I could tell you some stories, but I won't. So I'll now spend the next 22 minutes as I bite my tongue of all the things I wish I could say. No, just kidding. Uh, that is just the truth. Every church has some folks. Paul's spot on. Every church has those folks. But he's also true about the other side of the coin. This is what he says, remember? When I came to you, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. See, I can talk about church folks, but you think about preachers and you go, how many preachers have I had that had eloquence and superior wisdom? There was, no, no. How about, no, no, not them either. And you realize that list is almost non-existent too, right? Right? Paul just kind of puts it on the table. I'm not real, y'all aren't real bright. I'm not real talented. It is what it is. Well, what's left? I mean, if you've got a, uh, it sounds like a recipe for disaster. If you have a church that's not real bright and a preacher that's not real good, what's left? Well, the good news is that what's left is the good news. That's what Paul says. You hear it? When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as to proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, I could have decided to open up with my 23-week series on how to live your best life now. 
but I didn't. I could have decided that I was going to try to out-preach James and John, but, but I didn't. I could have decided to impress you with my oratory skills, but I didn't. This is what I decided. I decided to, do, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul says, I wanted my focus to be on Jesus, to be on what he has done for us, how he gave his life for us so that we could have life in him. That's where I wanted my focus to be. It's not about me. It's not about you, Paul says. It's about Jesus. And we need to be reminded of that. Churches forget that. Churches sometimes go through these seasons where they think, you know, if we just had a different preacher, it would be better. It would be all better. If our preacher could preach like the guy down the road, maybe we could draw some of those folks from that other church. If we had a preacher that was 30 years old that had been preaching for 40 years, we'd be set. That's all we need. Uh, we need somebody really young with tons of experience. That's all. If we just had the right preacher, all our problems would be solved. In the meantime, preachers are, are we're over here going, you know, if I could... If I could trade these folks to another church and maybe, you know, get a, get a better deal. Uh, I've often thought maybe we should have a draft. Maybe we have a, some two or three bad years that I could draft some better people. Then it would be okay. Then we could solve all our problems. Paul says, no. It's not you. It's not me. It's all about Jesus. If you read the scripture, we're reminded of that. Read through the Old Testament. The nation of Israel, tiny little piece of ground, when they were obedient and faithful to God, nothing could stop them because God was on their side. They went up against vastly superior armies and came out victorious because the Lord was on their side. Look at the disciples. Scripture says they were uneducated folks. They were not the smartest. They were not the most talented. They were not the most gifted. They were just average people. But they were filled with the Holy Spirit and turned the world upside down. Look at Paul on his way to hurt the church. Wound up meeting Jesus face to face and committing his life to taking the message of the gospel all over the known world. Paul says it's not about you and it's not about me. You know what God does? God takes ordinary people and ordinary preachers. Folks who love him brings them together and does extraordinary things. That's what God does. Now, I know, I know I'm not the greatest preacher in the world. And I hate to bust your bubble. You're not necessarily the greatest congregation in the world. But you know what we do together? We serve the greatest God. We serve a great God. And so Paul was able to write to the church. And say, as it was with me, when I came, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to you to know nothing. Now, I know that some, some of y'all think I stopped right there. That when I, got, when I got to do West, I just simply resolved to know nothing. Right? Uh, but Paul goes on beyond that. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But then he goes on. I came, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not wise, and were not with wise and persuasive words, but so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Why? So, because, so that uh, we come with power so that our faith won't rest just on, on, on ourselves on man's wisdom, but on the power of God. We give our best, not because our best is anything special, but because God gave his best to us. But still we give our best knowing that it doesn't rely on us, but it's all about what the power of God can do in, for, and through us. Paul says it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. If you want to know what this passage says, I think at its heart, it's just that simple. It's all about Jesus. If you want to know what Corinthians says in a nutshell, 
I think it's pretty much that simple. It's all about Jesus. Really, that's the message of all these letters. That's the message of the New Testament. That's the message. Genesis to Maps. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and we give you praise. That although we may not be the most talented, the most gifted, uh, the brightest, uh, Lord, all we can bring is all we are and all we have. But when we give it to you and we commit our lives to you, your Holy Spirit, your power works within us. And you do great things in, for, and through us. So Lord, let us come before you, remembering that it's not about us at all, that it's all about Jesus. Amen. Uh, as we stand and sing our closing song together, uh, come to the altar. Uh, if there's something on your heart about what you'd like to pray, you're invited to come and take some time and pray. Or I can pray with you, please let me know. But would you stand together as we sing?
Amen. Uh, before I, I, we close in prayer, uh, Daniel, is this your first time playing at 945? Uh, glad to have Daniel with us. Uh, he, is, uh, he plays a lot at 11. Good to have you here at 945. If you don't know Daniel, uh, let me assure you of this. The next time you hear him play, he'll be two inches taller. All right. Uh, following the benediction, uh, turn to greet your neighbor. Tell them God bless them. Tell them you enjoyed worshiping the Lord with them today. Lord, spend this forth, reminding us in all things, at all times, for in all ways, that it's all about Jesus. In his name we pray, in his name we worship, and in his name we go forth. And all God's people said, amen.